thank you for coming to our talk. We really appreciate that. So um, if you're in this room, most of you, I think, won't be surprised to see this. You've seen it in the headlines that, I mean, this year has been pretty hot in terms of ransomware, right? So we've seen several new families. We've seen many campaigns, very disruptive. So uh, I, I hope you agree with me that this has been actually the year of, ex of extortion, right? Yeah, so no, no shocks, right? Um, also, this might not come as a surprise. I mean, we have seen this, hopefully not on our laptops. Um, but in case you had seen it on your laptop, I hope you hadn't cried too much. Um, but in case you had cried, please cry no more. <laughs> because with this talk, um, we're going to show you a, uh, an innovative methodology that we have um, uh, prototyped that will allow for you know, a better world, hopefully with less uh, successful infections. Um, we've tested ShieldFS on uh, WannaCry. Um, of course, we haven't tested only on WannaCry. And one of the things that we want to point out since the beginning is that there were some files where uh, WannaCry succeeded. So in, in this specific example, it managed to encrypt uh, something like two, 200 files, right? It can change, but anyways. So uh, this is okay. I mean, we embrace it. We accept limitations of detection-based approaches. And we go one step, one step beyond. And we put a, a safe net, another, another additional layer of protection that will allow to uh, prevent all of these files to be lost forever. And that's, where, that's why you see uh, zero file loss. No file were lost at the end of the day. Uh, we also tested, of course, on other families, as I was saying. We tested it on the major ones, uh, including WannaCry, yes, of course. And uh, in most of the cases, we had successful detection. In some cases, we hadn't. But still, we managed to reach 0% file loss. This is pretty exciting. I mean, I, I'm really excited to present this um, because of this. Um, so at this point, I guess that in your mind there is one question. Why is ShieldFS, why this guy is telling us that ShieldFS is so different? Why is it making something that um, maybe other, other, other systems will not be able to do? So um, we've started something like 1.5 1, 1. years ago in this research. Um, and there were already other researchers observing uh, how ransomware was interacting with a file system. Um, and one of the things that was remarkable is that ransomware was interacting with a file system in a pretty you know, evident way. So the file system looked like the perfect place to observe ransomware behavior. We went a little bit further than that, and uh, we observed that not only ransomware is remarkable in the way it interacts with a file system, but also, it is completely different from how benign application interacts with the file system. So we base this, uh, this approach. Uh, we base this approach on this observation. We base, files, uh, we base ShieldFS on this observation, and we, we exploit this idea in two ways. First, for detection, we use this criterion, this observation, to discern benign from ran ransomware-like processes in, a, in an operating system. Um, we also, of course, uh, inspect the memory of the processes to look for crypto primitives, just in case there is some crypto material in there. It's a further um, confirmation that it's, it's a ransomware-like behavior. Uh, and then we exploit it for the second part of our approach. That is for protection. Inside our file system, because ShieldFS you might have understood from, from, from now on that it's actually a file system, from this point on, um, we also do protection embedded in the file system, in the sense that whenever our file system detects that something is you know, uh, suspicious or remarkably malicious, we do uh, take an additional protection in order to save those files. Of course, now it might look a little bit vague, but please uh, bear with us. So um, great, now let's, let me guide you to, um, to the first part of our story, that is, where do we start from to design uh, ShieldFS. So we started from collecting, uh, from collecting data. And the first question is, where do we, where do we look? Where do we uh, observe our, our traffic, so to speak? Um, our traffic is actually uh, file system I.O. So you can imagine, you can abstract the file system from, from the bottom of the user land as a 
basically a, a flow of IO packet request, IO request packets, sorry, or IRP. And those are the, the smallest atomic units of IO within the uh, Windows file system. And uh, there's actually a, a pretty nice interface if you're uh, if you want to develop a driver that allows you to hook up uh, very well into that into that position. Th uh, it's called the mini driver, uh, mini filter driver, and that allows you to see basically everything and to register callbacks for every event that you like. For example, um, here you see the the basic data structure that allows you to register uh, callbacks for like before a certain event, before a certain I/O, after a certain I/O. For example, when a file is uh, is created or when a file is read, you can uh, you can use this kind of callbacks in order to register and take action, right? So you can do that before you see an I/O or after the I/O goes uh, down to the actual file system. For example, you can use this interface to create, to log the activity on the file system. What you see on this table uh, from your left to your right is uh, what you can register as an example. You can register the timestamp, you can register the process ID, you can register the process name, any, anything that uh, you, you see flowing, flowing down to the file system. Um, the last one is the file path. Um, just one note. Uh, one read operation or write operation can result in Hundreds or, or thousands of these IO packet requests. So, if you if you're writing a giant file, you're going to see many of these requests. Um, so, we start with this toolset in in our hands, and uh, we install such a logging uh, agent into clean machines. We had e 11 volunteers that allowed uh, us to install this agent on their uh, everyday machines. So this, this was not a lab experiment. It was uh, you know, on real machines that people were using for their real activities every day. And uh, we ended up having something like uh, 2,000 worth of application data. Uh, these, um, these people were using collectively 2,000 and something more uh, applications. Um, as you can see from the left column, uh, the profiles of the user were uh, uh, various. We had some developers and power users, uh, some office users, some home users, so uh, a good variety, we believe. This resulted in something like 1.7 uh, billion IO packet requests, so a pretty uh, juicy data set to dig in. Um, secondly, as I told, we wanted to understand also how ransomware interacted with the file system. So we repeated the same experiment, this time in a controlled environment because we wanted to control the infection. Um, and so we had to use uh, virtual machines. Uh, for this, we, uh, we, we use the Cuckoo just because it's very nice for automation. So we use, uh, we use that. Um, and we installed, uh, I think it was two years ago, so 2015. I mean, those were the, the, the most prevalent families. So uh, that's what we used uh, for, for collecting data. Uh, an interesting point here is that, well, of course, we are all aware that uh, modern malware can evade uh, virtual machines. Uh, so we adopted all the possible countermeasures for that. Um, but on top of that, uh, ransomware poses a specific challenge to this because it needs to have certain content on the machine. So we put uh, real files, uh, I mean, realistically looking files. Uh, we emulated the same directory tree that we found on the 11 clean machines. So we kind of replicated the environment of a real user. We've installed browser extensions. We browsed through website in order to collect the history. So we tried to make a realistically looking machine. So that ransomware had triggers uh, and then the, you know honey files to to start. Great. So at this point we have clean traffic and uh, 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 ransomware traffic. I call it traffic because it's actually traffic. So now the question is how do we distinguish between uh, ransomware-like or benign? Um, the original title of our work when we conceived it was. Um, a self-healing ransomware wear file system. So uh, before going to the self-healing part, uh, I want to go to the ransomware aware part. So how do we make our file system ransomware aware? Uh, I'm going to be showing you a few of these plots. Um, so just to give you a guide to read them, on the horizontal axis, you see a quantity. It's going to be a variable uh, from 0 to 1. 
and on the vertical axis you're going to see a frequency. So how many times, how much, how popular that value is in our data set. So for example, uh, if you look here, uh, we can divide it into two quadrants. On the, on the top right you see that many times we see a high value. On the bottom left, few, few times we see a low value. And, and the same for the other two quadrants. Um, the variables that um, we were looking at, uh, for example, were uh, something like uh, folder listing operations. So how many times we have seen in our two data set a process doing file uh, for the folder listing operations. And as you can see, the red, the red distribution is shifted towards higher values. That is an, is an indication that actually is an evidence that says that ransomware is doing harvesting. This is something that ransomware has to do before uh, starting to encrypt. It has to harvest the, the system, right? Um, similarly, ransomware tends to do more reading operations because it has to, of course, read the files and then do something and then re uh, write them back. That's why we also see a, a, a change, sorry, not a change, but a difference in the amount of write operations um, uh, in, in case of ransomware versus benignware. Also, we see that uh, ransomware has... Um, a remarkable amount of file renaming operations. Even though this is not required for a ransomware, the ransomware can get through this and obtain the same behavior, we have seen that in, in the samples that we have analyzed there is a prevalence of uh, renaming operations. File type coverage um, has to do with how many different file types a process is, um, is interacting with. If you take, for example, um, Word or, I don't know, uh, Photoshop, they're going to interact with a very limited amount of uh, file types, right? Whereas ransomware, as we know, we have, um, there is a long list of files that it's targeting. So if we look at the diversity of uh, the file types that the ransomware is targeting, we see that it's shifted towards higher value with respect to a, a typical benign application that only targets a few types of files. File um, entropy, so, the, no, sorry, write entropy, that is the entropy of the content written, is not that remarkable if you think. I mean, if you look at this, it's not as remarkable as the previous ones. There is no such a, such a huge difference. So uh, this one should not be used alone. Like, if you look at the entropy alone, you're going to have a lot of false positives probably, right? Um, great. So now we have about six features, actually six features that we can look at. To tell, to, to tell apart uh, benign and malicious processes. Great, so what do we do with this? Uh, of course, this is the era of machine learning, so why not using machine learning? That's a, just a joke, but uh, we, use, uh, we, we really use machine learning. Um, so we, we train a series of classifiers. Uh, they are custom classifiers in the sense that we don't use off-the-shelf classifiers. We combine them in a, in a fairly complex way in order to tell uh, based on the traffic that we have just um, used, whether there is an indication of uh, ransomware or non-ransomware. So now you have at least a high-level view of what the ransomware-aware part of ShieldFS is. Now let's give you a, a still high-level overview of what we mean by self-healing. Normally, when you are interacting with a normal system without uh, ShieldFS installed, with, the, with no protections installed, what happens is when a ransomware application encrypts or damages or offends uh, in a generic way a file, any other processes that tries to interact with that file afterward, it will find, of course, the encrypted file. Uh, if you instead look at the system where uh, ShieldFS or equivalent is installed, uh, what we do is any time we see a write operation on a file from the first time from a process that has not been cleared, we save that file. So every time a process which we don't know yet if it's malicious or not, it, it tries to issue a write operation which can possibly change completely the file, we save that file before, go, before letting the write operation through, and this we can do it thanks to the Minifilter API. We save that file and then we let the operation through. So in case we have a fresh and, uh, you know, freshly made backup of that file. I mean, given like that is not, uh, you know, super clear, but 
Uh, now it's, a, it's time for digging, in, uh, digging into this. Andrea is the main author of this research, so um, be very welcome to swap ourselves. <laughs> All right. Thank you, Fede, for the wonderful animation. No worries. So uh, now we're going to walk into the details of the internals of ShieldFS. And let's start from the detector component. So uh, as Federico uh, briefly mentioned, we use a set of uh, detection models that we obtain by training some uh, custom classifiers. And we train these classifiers starting from the uh, persistent features that Federico showed you. And in particular, we have uh, two types of models. We have a first set of models that we call uh, process-centric ones that have been trained by looking at each process individually. Then instead, we have uh, another kind of model that we call system-centric one that instead has been trained by uh, considering all the data as coming from a single large process that is actually uh, the entire system. So this model, in comparison to the other one, uh, provides a, a big picture of the entire state of the system. And it is useful, for example, in cases of uh, multiprocess malware. On the other hand, the system-centric model can have a uh, um, higher false positive rate. So we'll see in a bit how we combine this model in a, in a way that actually can, can make it uh, more effective. And another interesting peculiarity about these detection models is that we don't have just a single model, but we train multiple classifiers. So as shown in this picture, instead of uh, training our classifiers using the entire data that we collected, we split the data in ticks or intervals uh, that are defined by the uh, percentage of accessed files. And for each tick, we uh, train different classifiers. And we organize this, these models, as shown in this picture, in what we call the multi-tier incremental approach. And this, this uh, organization, in this approach, has uh, mainly uh, two advantages. First, we have, uh, it can speed up the detection process. This is done because we have uh, specialized classifiers that are, uh, as I said, specialized for capturing the behavior of the ransomware during a certain phase. And also, this is uh, really effective in cases of uh, code injection. We know that malware nowadays use uh, such technique to inject malicious code into other processes. So we have that a process that has been benign in the past may turn to be uh, malicious in the future because a ransomware inject malicious code into it. And these models are effective in this in this scenario because they take into account different, different horizon in the lifetime of a process. So we have a shorter model, like in this feature model one, that takes into account only the recent history of the process, while we have a global model, on the other hand, that instead take in, takes into account the entire history of a, of, a, of a process. So the question is how frequently we ask these classifiers for an answer. So during each tick, we query these classifiers simultaneously. And the difference is that during the time when ticks go on, we reset uh, some of these models. So in this case, you can see that at tick one, model one just look at the recent activity uh, in the lifetime of, of a process. And this, is, of course, goes on also with the, with the other models. And at a certain point, we may end up in a situation like this one, in which all our model says that a process is malicious, we are pretty sure about it, we can say, okay, this, this is a ransomware. On the other hand, we can have a situation like this one, where instead, all our uh, detection models agreed in saying that a process is actually benign. But we can also have, instead, a situation in which we are a bit confused, so our, our classifiers are not pretty sure about the outcome of the detection. So what we can do? In, in this case, we have a state in which we, are, we say that the process is suspicious, and in this case, we leverage 
the uh, system-centric model that I uh, described before. So in this case, we look at the big picture of the system in order to have uh, more information about the, the current state of, of, the, of the protected system. And we can also do something more. What we do is we look for traces of uh, crypto functions uh, used by, by, by the process. So just a brief recap. Uh, we know that uh, most of uh, ransomware families nowadays use uh, block cipher. Block ciphers, they, they do it because they are fast. And the goal of ransomware is to encrypt all the files of the user uh, as soon as possible because they don't want to then want the user to notice that their file uh, are slowly uh, being encrypted. And block, cipher, uh, block ciphers work in an iterative way. So they perform different rounds of encryption. And for each round, they need a key to perform the uh, round encryption. So this means that there is a, um, a process that is called key schedule that takes an input, the user key, so that the key that the user or the developer provided to the cipher, and from that key, there, it derives uh, a set of sub-keys that are used, uh, each of them in a, in a different round during the encryption. And these sub-keys that are generated during the key schedule are, um, let's say, respect a mathematical relationship. So. The way these sub-keys are generated is known and deterministic. Of course, it depends on the, on the cipher you're using. But there is a mathematical relationship between these values. And these values are stored sequentially in memory for performing issues, performance issues, sorry. So what we can do? This is the situation in which, uh, for example, we can find in memory all these values uh, that are related uh, to, to the different rounds of encryption. And we can do, what we can do is uh, look in, in the memory of a process if there is a sequence of bytes that actually uh, match the mathematical relationship of, of the key schedule. If we find this sequence of bytes, we can say, OK, this is a key schedule, so it means that this process is using a block cipher, is, using, is, is performing encryption. So now you may wonder, yeah, but what about you find randomly some bytes that match this, this, this relationship? Well, the probability of, 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 of uh, finding this scenario is, is really, really, really low. For AES, that is the most uh, spread block cipher, uh, we have that in the worst case, the probability of a false positive is 2 to the minus uh, 1,344. So we can definitely say that this is unpractical, unpractical uh, it's unfeasible, and it probably will never happen. Okay, so now uh, let's look how all these components are uh, organized into the uh, architecture of ShieldFS. Here we have our uh, processes running in user space, and we have the I.O. manager provided by the operating system that allows processes to communicate with the file system and perform action on, on the file system. So reading a file, writing a file, and so on. And attached to this uh, I.O. manager, ShieldFS presents the detection component. So as we, we already saw, we have different models. We have the process-centric models. We have the system-centric model. And we also have the crypto finder that uh, can look at the memory of a process to spot any artifacts of, of the use of uh, uh, cryptographic primitives. And then we also have what we call the shielder that instead is the module that protects the user data. So it is the module that performs the copy before a file is uh, overwritten. And it, it, it is able to automatically and transparently to the end user restore the uh, original files when malicious uh, activity has been detected. Here in this picture, we envision to have a secondary drive, so a shadow drive in which we can store our uh, our copies, but this is not a fundamental requirement of, of our system. And if we uh, look uh, specifically to, at this uh, recovery uh, and, and protecting uh, process, we can, we can examine the uh, file recovery workflow of our system. 
So we have that at the beginning, when a process starts, ShieldFS considers it as, as unknown because uh, it, has, it has not enough information to say if it is malicious or not. So in this state, the process is monitored by ShieldFS, and ShieldFS applies a copy and write layer to um, perform a copy of a file uh, before it is uh, overwritten. And notice that for uh, performance issues, uh, we perform the copy of the file uh, just the first time it is modified. Then we keep this copy in a cache for a certain amount of time, and uh, whenever, uh, so if a process uh, overwrites, so modifies a, a file multiple times in a short time, multiple, yeah, sorry, <laughs> multiple times in a short time, uh, we perform the copy of the file just, just the first time. So then, when, when our detector uh, has collected enough information to say if a process is malicious or not, we can have a case in which we found that the process is malicious, and in this case, we can uh, transparently and automatically restore the original copies. On the other hand, we have that if a process has been detected as, uh, has been identified as benign, we can clear the, the old copies. This is not over because this is another step that is important. So whenever we say that a process is benign, we then say that it is unknown. So this might sound weird for you, but if, if you think about it, it's still related to the uh, code injection scenario. So we have that a process that has been detected as benign could turn to be malicious in the future because a ransomware inject malicious code into it. So we have to handle this scenario, and so whenever we say that the process is benign, then we, we keep considering as an unknown, and we keep monitoring its activity. And just a quick thing, if you're wondering how much this costs to the user, the answer is just a couple of cents. In fact, we uh, estimated the uh, storage overhead that our tool imposed to, to the end users by uh, estimating uh, this overhead uh, by looking at the data that we collected from uh, the uh, clean user that we have been monitoring for, uh, for a month. And we found out that in the worst case, uh, ShieldFS required uh, less than 15 gigabytes of additional storage. Or if you want to look at the percentage uh, in comparison to the uh, total amount of, of storage present in the machine, the overhead is uh, less than 9%. All right, so now you probably want to see some more numbers about the test, the test and the evaluation of ShieldFS. And first of all, we evaluated the, the detection and recovery capability of ShieldFS. So we used uh, almost 1,500 samples, uh, and these samples have never been seen during the training phase. So samples completely new and unseen by our detection models. Here you can see also some, some families of, of these samples. And even uh, more interesting, uh, you can see here that most of these families uh, were not present in our training set. So in our training set, there, there was no sample of these families. This means that our detection models are generic enough also to uh, detect different kind of ransomware activity uh, of different families. And in fact, we achieved a pretty good result, pretty good uh, detection rate, it is 96.9%. 90, uh, but even better, we found that uh, in all our tests, uh, the files that, that have always been protected by ShieldFS. So there was no file lost during the execution of this ransomware, even in the case of a misdetection. What does it mean? It means that the difference is that in the case uh, a process is correctly detected, ShieldFS can automatically and transparently to the end user uh, restore the original copies. On the other hand, if in the case of a misdetection, this cannot happen, but still we have the uh, copies of the original files in our secure storage and if the user, when the user notice the infection can uh, recover the uh, files automatically. 
manually, sorry. We also evaluated the false positives of our uh, detector. And to do so, we used a technique called uh, one machine off uh, cross validation. So basically, we took off uh, the data of one of our 11 machines from, from our training set. We trained the models, and then we test the models against the machine that we took off from our uh, training set. And we repeated this process for all the 11 machines. You can see here in this table the results of our evaluation. And if you look at the outcome table, you can see that in nine cases, we did not have any uh, false positive. And in the other two cases, we have really, really low false positives. So 0 0.26, 27, sorry, and 0.15%. And also, you can see in this table uh, that is interesting that uh, while the system-centric model alone has generally higher false positives, the combination between the uh, process-centric models and the system-centric one can get us uh, better results. So then we also uh, evaluated the uh, performance uh, impact of, of, our, of our tool. So we. Uh, perform some micro, micro benchmark, and we identify three scenarios that we evaluated for uh, measuring this, this overhead. And the first scenario is when a file is open and then read. Then we have uh, when, when a file is open and written for the first time. So in this case, ShieldFS performs a copy of the file before letting the uh, write operation uh, through. And then we also have uh, further um, open write uh, operations in which uh, the, the file has been already copied, so we have the copy in cache, and we don't need to perform uh, another, another copy. And the results are good in the first and the, in the last scenario, but you can see here that there is a quite high overhead in the second scenario. This is, of course, due uh, to the fact that ShieldFS is performing a copy of the file. However, we did not perceive such a big overhead while we were using machines in which we installed uh, ShieldFS. So we uh, tried instead to uh, estimate and, and compute the real um, overhead perceived by the users. And to do so, we uh, leveraged the, the data that we collected from the um, clean users. So we aggregate, aggregated the IRP logs that we collected into a sequence of uh, file system system calls. And we map this, this uh, sequence to the three scenarios that I showed you before. In this way, we were able to uh, estimate uh, the um, user perceived of the overhead that in this case is uh, on average about 26%. Uh, it is definitely uh, lower there than in the previous case and also uh, acceptable, um, acceptable by the user. All right, so now we'll have a, a little live demo. Uh, we're going to test uh, ShieldFS against WannaCry. I tried this demo like 20 times, so I don't see any reason why it shouldn't work, but in, in case I have a backup video, so don't worry. <laughs> And the interesting part here is that I'm using a machine that we used for our initial experiments in 2016. So I'm going to start this machine from a, a snapshot that is uh, February 2016. While we know that uh, WannaCry has been released just a couple, of, uh, a couple of months ago. So this shows that our detection models are uh, generic and can detect even unseen uh, new malware. All right, so first of all, I'm going to download the sample. OK, as you can see, also the uh, certificate check failed because of the uh, timestamp of the machine that is from 2016.
All right. So um, here is our sample. Before infecting the machine, I'm going to uh, show you some uh, decoy files that we placed in, in the machine. And I'm going to open this tool that allows us to um, see the logs generated by uh, kernel drivers. So we're going to see the log produced by ShieldFS during uh, its activity. Now I'm going to infect the machine. But before doing this, for, I'm going to shut down the network. So your laptops are fine. I'm not going to infect you. OK, these are the, the typical files uh, produced by uh, WannaCry when it he, when he starts. And we can see here <coughs> that there is a process that is performing a lot of operation on, on, on the disk. So it, uh, it's reading or writing uh, a lot of files. And in this case, it's our, it's our sample. And we can see also that here our decoy files are slowly uh, being encrypted by WannaCry. So uh, ShieldFS, in, this, in, in the meantime, is monitoring its activity, the activity of the process. And if everything goes well, we should see some log here. OK. So here, ShieldFS, the global model of ShieldFS, of ShieldFS detected suspicious activity. And it just uh, asked uh, the um, crypto finder to look for further proof. In this case, it didn't find any, any traces of the AES uh, block cipher, but it's, it's still uh, monitoring monitors the, the process. And we see that after two other ticks, so when the, the detection mode, the, the global model uh, detected the, the process uh, other two times in, in, the, in the further ticks, the, the ransom is, is finally uh, detected and killed by ShieldFS. So now, uh, for uh, demo purposes, uh, ShieldFS did not restore the, the files automatically, but I'm going to do it manually. But of course, this is, this is done usually uh, automatically by, by our tool. So here I'm going to start our uh, reverter. OK, that found the uh, process with, with the malicious activity that the, te the detector uh, identified. And here, you can see the files are slowly being uh, restored. You can see that the same files are uh, being uh, slowly restored. OK, we can uh, wait for the entire uh, revert process. OK, that's it. Everything is done. No file lost. We have our files back. Cool. OK, so to conclude the presentation, I'm going to leave the stage to Federico. Yeah, but you didn't put an animation for that. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you, Andrea. So um, it seems that we actually achieved. This is what, this is what, what we wanted to have. Uh, when we conceived this. I still remember in the whiteboard in the lab, we had uh, sketches that says we want a file system that natively supports uh, ransomware detection and reverting operation. Uh, if you're familiar with uh, ZFS and similar file system, you can already see some, some similarity of this. The fact that is that Z ZFS does not have any of these uh, ransomware aware capabilities. So this is what we got our inspiration, and we're very, very happy that we were able to make it. Uh, we had a detection component that implements a generic detection model. As you have seen, WannaCry didn't even exist when we created that machine. There's no signatures whatsoever. We trained uh, ShieldFS on a, few, on a few samples, 383, if I remember correctly, and that was it. Now we can detect WannaCry. Um, and the protection, well, you have already seen it in action. So uh, 
I think, um, I mean, I, I'm super, super happy of, of being able to, to work with Andrea on this, to be his advisor on this. Um, I think this is, uh, this is time for questions. Uh, just a, a reminder, there is also an academic paper describing this. Um, so if you want to dig into the, into the details, we've also set up a, a website where we collect some materials and so on. Uh, we are not releasing the, the code because we have a patent pending uh, number 27019. Uh, 27, um, for questions, we are available here uh, for brief questions like, do you guys go to the same barber? Yes. <laughs> or, <laughs> but you know, we have uh, for like elaborate questions and long questions such as why do you guys look bald, bot, right? Uh, bald. Uh, we have the wrap up room. Uh, so if you are available for, for longer questions, just feel free. We have a first question here. I'm going to, re yeah. Can you speak a little bit louder, please? Yes. Uh, I don't understand the last part of the question. Oh, I see. So what you're asking, if I'm, I'm just repeating both for recording and for you know, making sure that I understood, you're asking if there is a process that is harvesting many files in the system, is there a chance that we might confuse it with that? Um, it might trigger some of the features, not all of them altogether. That's why we have several features. Uh, in our experiments, we had applications performing like uh, zip operations or you know, uh, file uh, operations with many files involved and uh, high entropy, and we didn't see any of those false positives. But you know, a file that, uh, a process that really resembles like a ransomware activity with encryption, with harvesting and renaming and everything, well, it's a ransomware or you know, it's, a, it's, a funny, it's a funny program. <laughs> Thank you. Any other questions? Oh, we have many there. I, I, sorry, we don't know which, which came first, so. <laughs> sorry? Yeah, that would be great. Much better. You were able to uh, identify the crypto algorithm that the ransomware uh, used to, um, to use to encrypt the, the files, the AES algorithm. Um, out of curiosity, were you able to find the, their key or any interest in, in deeper analysis? Yep. So um, when you look and detect the key schedule, the first, let's say the first row, the key schedule is the, the actual key, so the real key that is used for the encryption. So once we recover the key, we could use, for example, that key to decrypt the files instead of using our uh, copies. But this process is unreliable. So detecting the, the, the traces of, of, of a crypto function is not reliable. You cannot guarantee 100% of files uh, protected and recovered by, by, by using such approach. So yes, we could recover the key, but it is not totally reliable. So this is why our, our approach does not completely rely on this. How do you deal with concurrency if multiple applications are writing the same file, possibly multiple benign applications, but you said in one diagram that the banana application gets a copy of the file, whereas the most application gets the original file. Yeah, so uh, first of all, we perform the copy of the file just the first time. So the first, the first application that writes that file, and then in that case, we perform the copy. So, and we store the copy in a, in a secure storage, and we keep it in, in a cache for a certain amount of time. So the other application can still access, the, access that file and write the file, modify it, and so on. And then in a, in a short period while we have the, that file in cache, we, don't, we do not perform any other copies, but once the uh, cache expires, we will perform another, another copy of the file on the next write operation. Okay. Thank you. So if you want to see it in a, from another perspective, it's like a, an extension of an existing backup system that very frequently takes snapshots. So if you have like backups backing up like every half hour, with this, you extend the lifetime of the backup to the last, I don't know, a few minutes or to the last hour. Okay, thank you. So going along those lines, <clears throat> from an ESX standpoint, uh, you know, taking snapshots, also 
Uh, two separate questions, sorry. Uh, also, how does it integrate or interact with uh, antivirus products like McAfee or malware bytes or anything like that? Because you're doing a lot of read writes, you're doing a lot of sniffing, and yeah. both of those are doing that too. So from an implementation uh, point of view, in this uh, mini filter, um, with, with these drivers, with these mini filters, uh, there is like a, a stack of, of these drivers, and you can select uh, the altitude of the driver, in, so the position, which one should be on the top and which one should be on, on, on the bottom. So according to the different requirements of the different uh, tools of the different uh, programs, we could place our, our, uh, our tool in, in, the right, in the right position. Thanks. Without interfering, with, with, of course, with the, with the other software. Thank you. Thank you. Do, you have, do you have some thoughts on like kernel-based malware, ransomware, and uh, second, like Petya, like you know, approaches which would like overwrite and then do the encryption from a completely different environment? Can, can you can you repeat yeah, the question, okay. please? Because the, I the, the very first part wasn't clear. So the so do you have some thoughts on kernel-based attacks, oh. right? That, that because your system is based on kernel. Just wondering if you have any thoughts on that. Yeah. And second was yeah, ransomware that might, like, o Petya kind of approaches, right, that overwrite the MBR, then do the encryption from a completely different subsystem, right, that emulates BIOS or something like that. All right. So uh, this is uh, kind of out of, of our, our uh, scope. But in the case, for example, of, of uh, Petya, uh, even though it does not actually encrypt the files, uh, but our, our approach in performing the copies and protecting the, the, the user data will still uh, be effective against this kind of attack. So you can still uh, try to recover manually the, the encrypted files. And if I could continue on the, yeah, on, sure. the kernel, on the kernel type of attack, I mean, our attacker model, as you can clearly see, is the attacker is not in the kernel, right? Um, as it, you know, most of the time is, if the attacker is in the kernel, even if you have an antivirus, I mean, might be too late, right? Um, so I think this opens a completely different research line that stands with how do you ensure that you can monitor from, from the outside, like in an enclave or uh, from DMA stuff and things like that. But um, this is a bit, you know, a parallel research line than, than ransomware, but it's a very, you know, on, 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 yeah, interesting question. Okay, Thank you. Thanks. Thank you. Still have, I think, a couple of minutes for questions, if you guys have some. I had, uh, I had one. Um, if if a uh, attacker understood your file system, how would you estimate that they would best try to subvert it? Like if they were to use Invasion. a different encryption, uh, encryption algorithm or something, like what do you see the weakness in your approach? You're asking about if, if we can design an, evas an evasive malware that precisely That can bypass, bypass your detection algorithms. Well, it's, it's really about uh, how you can evade all of the features altogether. So you have to write a very slow ransomware that doesn't rename many files in a short time, uh, that uh, maybe doesn't rename any files at all, that it writes files very slowly, low level of entropy. So it's kind of a, against the, uh, the business model of a, of a classical ransomware. Uh, but yes, I mean, if you have enough time, you can design a malware that is, you know, silent enough. Uh, we have thought about it, but uh, in the paper, there is a section where we describe all the variables that are involved that are m more than what we have explained here. Uh, there is the possibility for, for designing a, a, an evasive sample, like targeting ShieldFS. Um, but we believe it's pretty, you know, distant from what the attackers want to do. Um, it is probably easier for the attacker to evade the encryption detection than sure. evading the features. Also, another thing that the attacker can do to make it difficult to be detected uh, that, that we did not really test because there is no sample that does this is like, for example, using a lot of processes. So if you, for example, uh, consider in the worst case uh, a malware that spawns different processes and each process encrypts just one file. You, you would see that that process is not benign because it's accessing and encrypting just one file. But in that case, that's why we included the system-centric model that instead look at the, at the big picture of the system. So unfortunately, we didn't test it so well because we didn't find any, any malware that does this. But this could be a way to make our ShieldFS detector uh, job really, really difficult. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you. 
I guess maybe do we have time for we the have last time for question? the last question? Just One hi. more question. Um, so, what does uh, where does your uh, backup of the original files reside? Hmm. And if it this, if it resides in the file system, have you encountered a ransomware that was able to encrypt the backup of the files? This is an interesting question. Uh, so our um, uh, backup can can be uh, stored in the same file system or in, in for example in a, in a secondary drive but the important thing is that uh, we make the folder in which we store our copies uh, not accessible by user space application so no user space application can can write in that folder only uh, kernel, kernel, on, on the kernel side so only our module that is in the kernel can uh, write uh, can write into that folder so we deny any write operation from from the user land Thank you. Thank you.